Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on March 28th. It's a Tuesday. Here we are at First Presbyterian Church. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. And we're going to do what we ordinarily do, and that is to read our daily lectionary texts for today. But because of some uh, scheduling issues, we're going to try it today. I don't know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll get another one in, but we're still thinking about next week, Holy Week. I don't know. We'll see how it plays we'll out. We'll but, see if we can um, get some, a few in. Yeah, we'll see if we can get a few in <laughs> at the very least. But uh, I certainly uh, look forward to this opportunity every time we have a chance to do this. So uh, let me open this in a word of prayer. Uh, gracious and Heavenly Father, we are thankful to you. We're thankful that you are a God who meets us, who comes down to us, not just in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, but through the word that you give as recorded in our Holy Scripture. Um, Lord, as we read these texts today, I pray that they would fulfill their function and that they would change us, that they would penetrate deeply into our hearts and that we would respond appropriately. Um, Lord, enlighten us, uh, these familiar words and sometimes unfamiliar ones. Uh, we, we trust to be your word to us. And so we thank you and praise you. It is in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. So this morning we're going to start with Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his holy ones, for those who fear him have no want. The young lions suffer want and hunger. But those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Which of you desires life and covets many days to enjoy good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord rescues them from them all. He keeps all their bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil brings death to the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Our Hebrew prophecy today comes from Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 8 through 17. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, I am going to send for all the tribes of the north, says the Lord, even for King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants, and against all these nations around. I will utterly destroy them and make them an object of horror and of hissing and an everlasting disgrace. 
and I will banish from them the sound of mirth and the sound of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Then after seventy years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. I will bring upon that land all the words that I have uttered against it, everything written in this book, which Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall make slaves of them also, and I will repay them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. For thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and go out of their minds because of the sword that I am sending among them. So I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me drink it. And from Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. Brothers and sisters, my heart desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. I can testify that they have a zeal for God, but it is not enlightened. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Our gospel text today comes from John chapter 9, starting in verse 18 and running through verse 41. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing, for you do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind? If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, 
You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. And back to our Psalms, Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I will wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who are they that fear the Lord? He will teach them the way that they should choose. They will abide in prosperity, and their children will possess, shall possess the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my life and deliver me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all its troubles. And our final psalm today is Psalm 91. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. And these are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, I think, well, while we're getting into the scripture today, um, I'm just a little bit mindful of what happened in Nashville and that horrible school shooting um, at that uh, Presbyterian school there in Nashville. Um, and it does make me pause and reflect upon uh, you know, the loss of life and uh, the ways that as humans we are always trying to find explanation or uh, find a way to, um, to deal with such unimaginable horror because um, it, it is horrible and I can't possibly imagine what um, what was going on in that particular place at that time in the minds of the victims uh, or even in the mind of the, the perpetrator. Um, 
it is a reminder to, to all of us about how evil continues to exist in the world. Um, and in light of the Psalms that we read, especially Psalm 91, I know that there are many who claim the Psalm on an ongoing basis and, uh, and, and, and rightfully wonder, you know, when, uh, you know, is this really true? Does this really apply to people of faith? Um, and, and I want to say unequivocally, yes, it, it does. It does apply. Um, it is one of these psalms where uh, we know that there is uh, both an immediate application and there is a Christological application. How does this apply to Jesus? And then we also know that for all of us who live in this time between Jesus' first coming and Jesus' return, that there is a, the mystery of the already and the not yet, how we can claim all of the truths in Scripture, but we recognize uh, that there is a greater fulfillment to still come. And so uh, please know that uh, my heart and my prayers are with those uh, in Nashville and those affected by it. And for everybody that then now feels a renewed sense of the threat that might um, that, that continues to exist in the world. Right. We know that not all evil has been uh, fully eradicated yet. And at the same time, we do believe that Jesus is uh, ruling over and reigning over all of creation and ultimately will bring all of the things uh, subject under his feet. And so um, recognizing that mystery and, and in, in, in humility and humbleness, uh, understanding that I cannot explain um, those mysteries that continue to exist. How can these words be true? And how then can we continue to uh, struggle and suffer through unimaginable horrors? Um, and so that being said, um, yeah, let's see how we can move to the yeah. rest of our scriptures. Well, and I think, too, when things happen like this, you know, we do want to make sense of it. We want to understand, because if we don't understand, we can't move forward and prevent it. And that's, but it is, it is so difficult to understand. And, and, and there isn't an answer. There isn't an answer that can explain it away. Right. Uh, well, verse 18 from Psalm 34, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. So there's a very definitive statement there um, that people uh, will be brokenhearted, that people will be crushed in spirit. Um, there's, there's the promise that the righteous will be uplifted and that the wicked will be punished. Um, and I think this is probably one of the greater mysteries of, of the Christian faith right. is, uh, yeah, how do, how do these things continue to happen? And, and I do think in so many ways, um, um, we who have been accustomed to or have grown accustomed to uh, lives of comfort and lives of uh, relatively free from affliction or persecution, right. uh, we see these uh, events like in Nashville or in other places as, as aberrations, like these things just shouldn't happen in a civilized world, uh, but in a way making our own understanding or definition of what is um, the only things that should happen, uh, making that an unrealistic expectation. Again, we who are largely affluent and uh, live in wonderful relative peace um, can forget that the history of the world is, any, if anything, an indicator that the world is not a safe place. The world is not a good place. In other passages of scripture, it says that all of creation continues to groan under the weight of the sin of humanity and is waiting for final deliverance. Um, and so, so taking these Psalms in the context of even when they were written, um, and and the Psalms themselves acknowledge the the brokenheartedness, but the Psalms are also looking forward to salvation and redemption and justice being done. 
Um, there's healthy tension in right. the songs themselves. Well, there is hope offered. There Absolutely. Is hope as we read through the, these, there there is hope. There is comfort. Right. Um, in the midst of the difficulties and the afflictions and the brokenheartedness, and there is still hope. Right. Right. So if we look at that Jeremiah passage from Jeremiah 25, mm -hmm. um, I, I do find it interesting in the sense of uh, the, 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 the judgment is being laid out. You right. have not obeyed my words. Therefore, I'm going to take all the tribes from the north, including Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, whom the Lord describes as his servant, mm -hmm. that even... Even the pagan kings right. are in service to the Lord. They might not understand it. They might not be aware of it. They might right. think they're acting of their own accord. But even the kings of the pagan nations are being used by God for God's purposes. And so the destruction that God brings, um, there's a limit to the time. Jeremiah says, they will come, they will enslave you, it will be for 70 years, and at the end of the 70 years, the Babylonians themselves will then be judged for their excessiveness. And, and how does God use um, us as believers? Right. How does God use even the pagan nations, but within all of that, to accomplish God's purposes? Right, and, and I think people, um, the pagan nations, you know, like you said, he uses them. They fall under his authority. Right. Um, sometimes you hear that word used and it's like, oh. <laughs> but, but the reality is that even though they may not um, choose to follow or they, you know, they are pagan, they do fall. He is the creator and they do fall under his authority. Mm -hmm. And there are, there is judgment. There is, um, and yes, he does use that's, I mean, that's the word that they, I mean, that's, they, he does use them to accomplish his, right. his will, um, because they do fall under his authority. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably a, a nice way to say it, right? You know, they <laughs> fall under the authority of God. Um, you know, and I, I think that begs the question then, uh, we who are, you know, we who are followers of Jesus Christ and we who are, you know, intentionally, Every day, you know, trying to submit ourselves again to God's authority. Right. Um, that, you know, God does call us into good covenant partnership. You know, right. what are we supposed to be doing on this world? And I really don't think it's to just kind of accumulate, you know, a life of ease for ourselves. Right. Um, you know, especially again in light of the condition of humanity where relative ease is relatively rare you know i get it that i'm grateful that the living conditions around the world is improving it's, it's nice right. that people can have a chance to live um uh, less in danger of famine or greater opportunities for health and things um and that's a good thing that's a positive thing that we right. should celebrate right um and and i think is in a large part because of the work that people of faith have accomplished in this world, uh, the care and the compassion for humans, uh, recognizing created in God's image and all of those things, not to be exploited, right. uh, but to be loved and to serve. I think that's huge. But then the flip side of it is, if we get too accustomed to those things, then maybe we don't act with the urgency that God might be calling us to act. Right. Mm. I don't know, maybe I've gone off on a tangent, like, <laughs> I don't know, it's just, it's just what's been on my mind lately, and, I, and, I, and the, the danger is always, you don't want to take the text and try to apply it to what we think is going on, I think right. what we need to do regularly is what is the text trying to say, and how do we uh, uh, fit in with what the text is saying, so um, I'm not trying to Say that make it, so I'm not yes. trying to make it fit into my preconceived box, I'm, uh, but I, I can understand I think how that could be a little exactly problematic. That's exactly what the Romans passage speaks to. Then let's look I at it. Then that's exactly what the Romans. Um, you know, it's. Um, let's see here. Right there, those first verses. As I can testify, they have a zeal for God, but they are not enlightened, being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God, seeking to establish mm. their own, for they have not submitted to God's righteousness. But then it goes on and it says, you know, who will ascend or who will descend, because that is somehow putting constraints 
on Christ and his abilities. Right. And that's putting constraints on, on him, you know, on, um, on what he can do. It's, it's, it's putting him in that box and mm-hmm. saying, this is it. But he's, he's bigger than that. He's greater than that. Right. And our faith um, shouldn't question and limit um, what he is capable of. But our faith is trusting that he is capable of being God. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's... Um, right. Um, and I think, I think that was Paul was addressing that tension between uh, you know, Jewish believers in the church and Gentile believers in the church and how you know, the Jews had all of these uh, good, you know, the commands, the covenants, the promises, mm-hmm. all these things. And, and uh, the Gentiles are, are in the church now. And it's just like, well, you know, which one's better? It's just like, Jesus is better. Right. Jesus is it. You know, all of these things can be very good. Right. But if you're trying to make any of these things or any of these things, like if you try to elevate that over anything else, it's like, no, the whole point is Jesus. The whole point is believe, right. confess, right. faithfulness. Right. And it, it doesn't matter what your label is. It's right. um, Jesus. Yeah, creating our own righteousness or or our own understanding of righteousness, right? Mm-hmm. You know, if I put in the proper prayer and I pull the proper handle, then God will respond in the proper way. Right. But like you were saying, you, know, you can't put Jesus into that box. You know, mm-hmm. God is working beyond our own understandings of righteousness to draw us to his righteousness, right. uh, which is superior. And how many times is the answer not what we expected, Mm -hmm. but yet, even though it looks different than what we anticipated or what we wanted, um, it's better. Or it's more than we could have. It is. Um, Which includes, then, the difficulties. It has to include the difficulties. And, And that's the part I think that's most difficult for us to understand or we're troubled by. And even from the John passage, um, pretty comes pretty clear to us because uh, I know I know I preached on it a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago. The man born blind, but again, the understanding was if you are not blessed with physical sight, you must therefore be cursed. And and Jesus is like, that's not how it works. You know, there are difficulties and challenges that actually do lead to greater glory in God and an opportunity for the community to experience those things in a different way. Right. Well, and and, and I'm sure we've said it here. I know I've said it um, in other places, but, you know, there's this tendency for people when they are going through something difficult to say, what did I do wrong? And that's exactly what this speaks to. Well, like you said, obviously you are living this life blind, I think of all the senses that would be the most difficult. That's just me personally. I just, that is the one that I feel like would be the most difficult to. (laughs) As we both have our glasses and and have our contacts. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. But that to me would be such a difficult sense to not have. And so this man living in darkness, um, literal darkness, um, you know, you must have done something to deserve this. Right. And, um, but that is not, right. that is not, um, that is certainly not the case in John chapter nine. No, there, yes, there is no, there was, this was not a result of something. Right. There was no but, judgment being made against that man or against his parents. Um, right. and yet at the same time, uh, everyone believed that right. it took this miracle to change hearts But we know that not all of the hearts were changed. Right. Some remained in their spiritual blindness because Mm -hmm. they couldn't get out of that box of their own understanding of righteousness. This this has to be the way it is. And they get increasingly mad and frustrated and put people out of relationship, kick them out of the synagogue because, because they received their sight from someone that did something different than their own little box of righteousness. Right. And it's like, wow. And he didn't do it on the right timeline because right. he did it on the Sabbath, which right. I don't know that we've read that. Maybe that's from a few weeks ago when right, we were right. when you were preaching on it. But this idea that you you can do good things or, or Jesus could do good things, but it had to be, we still have to follow. I mean, like, we've got to follow the rules here. Right. We've got to make sure that it's done in the proper channels versus care for people. Right. 
right? Do we make our laws such that we forget the purpose of those laws? And the laws were meant to, uh, they were meant to be something that drew us closer to God and actually even closer with each other. Um, um, and it was meant to demonstrate to a wider audience of what faithful obedience looked like. Um, right. Even even sacrificial obedience, like mm -hmm. things that are difficult to do, um, but uh, you know, how does God bless those who who maintain faithfulness in the midst of the challenges? Is meant to be that light to the to the Gentiles, and so and so you know, I, I I'm hesitant to even. I'm hesitant to even go here, but you know, as tragic as uh, the shooting in Nashville is, um, and this is not an excuse of evil or an excuse of wickedness at all, but how how can faithful people um, glorify God in the midst of this? You know, I know that there are other stories of. Uh, you know, tragedies that occur that actually um, bring communities closer together, actually result in reconciliation between people who have been estranged, who um, find ways to overcome evil with good. Right. As bad and as wicked and as tragic as evil is, God is bigger than all of these things. And there are times that it probably doesn't feel like that. I guarantee I you that there are times. I think when you're living those times, it is right. so very difficult to see um, God's hand in things. Right. And um, I think those are moments that have the most, um, have a great ability for transformation in people's hearts and in people's lives. But it is right. extremely difficult to see that when you're living it. Right. And, you know, that can't imagine that, un, you know, just the un, it is unimaginable. It, it is. It's unimaginable. Of what these people are going through and what these families are going through that, you know, this was just a normal day. And then right. this, right. you know, the phone calls that, I mean, that sure. I can't imagine. Well, uh, you know, and just, just as examples, uh, you know, the, the shooting, gosh, how many years ago it was in, in Charleston in that church mm -hmm. where, you know, the guy comes in and shoots down these people in a, in a Bible study and the racial animosity that was going on with that as well, but how that community uh, refused to be overcome by hatred and actually it has led to opportunities for greater conversations for racial healing um, or, or the Amish community shooting that occurred, gosh, 30 years ago now where where the whole family um, I mean the community went around the family of the shooter and were were uh, kind to to them right. and and built uh, reconciled relationships right. and and that family is hurting today and, too and, right, that family right, is yeah. reeling um, right as well yeah. I mean sometimes I mean it's easy to point fingers and it's easy to forget that side um, right. there are members of that family mm -hmm. um, that are are reeling as well or or you know you, you think of any other challenge or right. you know struggle that's going on you know you you think about you know things three hours south of here at the border where Absolutely. how how can you be compassionate to people who are undergoing such enormous uh, stress and uncertainty and fearfulness as they as they try as they as they legitimately try to have a better life for themselves right. and for their family, um, and at the same time, how do you uh, um, exist within a just the complications of, of national sovereignty or things like that? And right. it's just complicated complicated questions and right. i think and i think a big thing for people who are followers of jesus is to take a posture of, of humility yeah. and uh you know seldom seldom should we ever if ever jump to conclusions about things right. uh, we should be uh, you know other passages of scripture you know slow to speak quick to listen right. you know just the uh, being present with somebody in the midst of their pain, not um, insisting that they get over it, but being present with them in the midst of that. Um, you know, again, back to back to Psalm thirty-four, you know, verse four. I sought the Lord, and He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. 
you know, the, the psalmist is not immune to being afraid, right. um, but what does the psalmist do? The psalmist does need to seek the Lord. And, and that's where, um, you know, I think this is where individually we need to do those things, but as a community, you can't force that. You just right. have to make it available. You have to give space. You. You have to be patient. Uh, I, I can't look into your heart or your mind and know what's going on in the midst right. of your challenges, but we can certainly we can certainly be together and try to be around the word together right. um, as a community of faith. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't know if I have any more to say. I don't either. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's tough. Mm -hmm. It's tough. Um, and it's, like you said, there's a tension and, and we don't, we don't have all the answers. Right. Well, uh, again, whole counsel of scripture, um, as, as believers, you know, this, this is the word of the Lord. Don't, as good as any one part of it is, don't, take only one part take take the really difficult things and take the really encouraging things right. um, and and let's learn how to give God the glory in, in all of those things um, and and remember that we worship a God who is himself accustomed with grief uh, is a is accustomed with sorrow uh, a, a God who knew what was going to happen before he even came down from heaven and took on flesh and dwelt among us. He knew that the plan, uh, Jesus knew that the plan was to die right. um, so that then we might live. And, and yet he came willingly, he came obediently. Um, and, and he, um, yeah, he, he went through the unspeakable uh, because he loved us because he continues to love us. Right. Yeah. And so, yes, we do. We worship a God that understands sacrifice and pain and sorrow and suffering. Um, you know, not to recap the whole thing, but you know, Sunday, that's, that's what we, you know, the children and I sat on the steps and that's what we talked about in the story of Lazarus. And, and Jesus goes to Lazarus after he has died and he knows fully and completely what has happened and he knows what he is going to do and in that he says that it is to to be glorifying to God but in those moments he is overcome himself and he weeps with Mary and Martha in the mourners and he um, he feels our pain right. he feels our right. sadness he understands that um, he did come down fully human and he understands sorrow and suffering and sadness um, he gets yeah. it and he knows yeah, praise God that he does right right yeah because you know again this life is a still full of challenges and sometimes terrors right. um, you know and again that's where Psalm 91 right you know don't fear don't don't fear the arrow that flies by day or the destruction that wastes noonday it's uh, Sometimes I think we have to go through them, uh, but I think in all of that, it can lead to a greater appreciation, a greater worship of, a uh, greater faith in Jesus Christ. And so again, our, our prayers are with those people who are suffering right now and the brokenhearted and, um, uh, and for those of us who, who mourn, um, not in physical proximity to them, but ourselves reminded of the daily challenges that we face. Um, you know, even here in San Angelo, just there are people who are grieving and suffering loss. Um, and how can we, as faithful people, uh, be present with them uh, and encourage them um, and, and ourselves continue to live lives of faith? Yeah. Well, okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. All right. Well, yeah. In, in, in humble humility, right? right. I, I think I have to be good with that. I can't explain that. The, yeah, right. There it is. We don't, we don't have all the answers. Thank you for, um, thank you for being willing to close this prayer. I know. <laughs> we don't have all the answers. And, and, and as many answers and as good as this is, I think it offers us hope. 
-hmm. when there is not an answer, I think it offers us hope. And um, so. Yeah. Our hope is in Jesus Christ alone. Right. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Heavenly Father, loving Father, gracious and merciful Father, we come to you today and we pray for um, the families of this Nashville shooting. And I just pray that they do have loving and compassionate communities that surround them and that they be lifted up um, in such a way that they can see you and that um, that your glory is shown through um, through the suffering. Um, be with them and um, allow them to feel your presence. And we know that they're not the only ones. There are people suffering and there are people that uh, live in uncertainty and uh, times of affliction and despair. Just be near them and allow them to feel your presence. And for those of us um, that um, may not be living that right now, um, help us to, to shine a light on you. Help us to do the work that you call us to do so that we can shine a light in the world that it can be so dark. And um, we come to you humbly looking towards you with hope, knowing that our hope is found in you in the good times and in the difficulties. And in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thanks for joining us today. And uh, we'll, we'll post another one when we have an opportunity to do so. But if you have any questions or comments and concerns, don't hesitate to reach out to the church. We'd be happy to listen to you and to pray with you. Um, we might not very well have any of the answers that you're seeking, but we can certainly point you to the one who does. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye.